All right, class, we're going to start our uh, investigation about functions. A um, couple vocabulary words here. Um, dependent variable, uh, that's the variable that changes the response to another variable. Um, it's called dependent because you think about what that word means. You depend on something, so its value depends on something else's value. Um, independent variable, that means it doesn't depend on something else. It could be anything it wants to be. Um, when we're talking about those two things, uh, your dependent variable uh, is going to be your vertical axis, and your uh, independent variable is your horizontal axis. Uh, those are things you guys talk about in science a lot. Um, you know, we like to call our horizontal axis the x-axis, the vertical and the y-axis, but the Term or depending on the function or type of function, we might relabel those. For instance, in science, your horizontal axis or your independent variable is a lot of times time. I think about time, nothing impacts time, nothing can change time. It's independent of all other things. Um, but, like, maybe let's say, like, temperature of water um, might depend on the time that is elapsed, that that water has been off the stove or something like that. Um, so the temperature then would depend on the time. Uh, independent variables are called inputs or input values, and the dependent variables are your outputs or output values. Um, the way I like to think about functions are um, to think about them as like a juicer or a food processor. Uh, so the juice that you get out is the output, but the fruit that you put in or the vegetable that you put in was called the input. Uh, so when we talk about functions, let's say I've got my um, let's see here sort of a rough sketch of a juicer here. And this is, we're going to use f of x for function notation. But I'm going to take a number, and I'm going to put that number inside here. Our operations, order of operations, that kind of stuff, is going to do something. It's going to transform this number, and it's going to kick out a new number. And that new number might sometimes even be the number that we put in. And we'll talk about the situations that that could occur in. Um, most times it's going to be different, but this would be our input, and this number here is our output. Okay, so we've done this a little bit with, like, uh, substitution. Like, if I have, like, y equals 2x plus 3, and I ask you to find y if x equals, let's say, 2. So what would happen is that in my juicer or food processor here, okay, 2x plus 3 would be this thing. I would plug in my number of x equaling 2. I would drop that into my food processor, let my food processor do the work to it. So it's going to take that 2, put it right there. 2 times 2 would be 4, plus 3 then would be 7, and the output is 7. So the input was 2, the output was 7. But this 7 depended on that 2. Because if it was a 3, put 3 in here, I would get a 9 out. So this value, depend, 7 or 9, depended on whether I chose a 2 or a 3. So that's kind of the, the relationship there between inputs and outputs. Um, a lot of examples that you see early on trying to develop an understanding for these relationships is to look at things that we kind of already know. Uh, so we, we have a pretty good understanding already of perimeter, the distance around a shape. Um, so here they're, all they're doing is they're taking these rectangles and they're making them adjacent to one another. Um, and it says if you have one rectangle, what's the perimeter? Well, it would be two sixes plus two ones. And that's going to give me, what, 12 plus 2 is 14. So then I would have an ordered pair. My x value would be 1. My y value is 14. So 
that's my input and output. Input of 1, output of 14. Then if I go to 2, okay, thinking about the the perimeter here, I have a 6 and a 6 now. Now this line here in the middle, that's not perimeter, that's not on the outside anymore. I would have two 6s still, but now I have, what, how many times do I see this 1 show up? I see that 1 show up four times now, okay? This would be four ones. Um, and that gives me then, what, 2 times 6 is 12, plus 4 is 20, so then I have the 2 comma 20. The next one is 3, so again, this is 6, so I still have two 6s, plus then... Now I have three of these ones there, and I'll have three of these ones there, so it'd be six ones. That's going to give me, what, 12 plus six. I did some bad math up here. Uh, this would be 12 plus four is 16. Sorry about that. And this would have been, so this is, what, 12 plus so 18. 16, 18. So then I have 2, comma, 18. And if I have 4, so again, it's still 2 times 6. Plus now, you have 4 ones there, you have 4 ones there. So this will be 8 ones, and that will be 20. So my order pair will be 4, comma, 20. So here, is it obvious that the perimeter depends on the number of rectangles? Okay. I think it is. Okay, the more rectangles we have, the greater the perimeter, the less rectangles we have, the smaller the perimeter. So when constructing a table, you want to structure your independent variables so there's a pattern to their values. I think we're seeing a pattern here. Okay. Two, four, six, eight. Okay. Um we're seeing all these ones here. So we'll talk about this pattern here in a moment. Um so if you do so, then you will often see a pattern in the dependent variable. Okay, so we see a pattern here in the 14, 16, 18, and 20 numbers, increasing by twos. It should be a three here. So our independent variable is increasing one, two, three, four, and our dependent is increasing by twos. Um, so the pattern set up here is the independent variable increases by one. What is the pattern for the dependent variable? I just said that they're increasing by two. So this can be written in a better way the table, and we can write it as an equation. If we let x be the number of rectangles, okay, so let x be the number of rectangles, um, and y be the perimeter, okay, we should be able to write an equation for this scenario. What's, what's nice about this is that we see in each one of these that 2 times 6 is constant, the same. So that is going to be um, true in all these, so 12 is going to be part of my equation. But now if I look at the 2, the 4, the 6, and the 8, okay, uh, those are changing. How does that 2 change compared to that 1? And then the question is, well, does that same pattern exist there with those two? Does it exist with the 6 and that 3? And then does it exist again with this 8 and that 4? And I think you can see the pattern if I take this number and multiply it by 2, I get that number. Take that number, multiply it by 2, I get that number. That number by 2 gives me that number. That number by 2 gives me that number. So this was the 12. Then I've got this plus here. And then to get these numbers, I'm taking essentially 2 times whatever x was. And now I'm multiplying all of those that read 2x by 1, so I don't really need to write anything, times 1. And that should equal y. And now the question is, does that thing show these ordered pairs? If I let x be 1, so 12 plus 2 times 1, does that give me 14? It does. So that ordered pair, 1, 14, we see came from or is produced using this equation. So that equation so far makes sense. Let's see if it works for this one. If I plug in 2 for x, I have 12 
plus 2 times 2. 12 plus 4, does that give me 16? 2, 16. Try one more. 2 plus 2 times then 3. What's 12 plus 6? Is that 18? Yes, it is. So here's my rule that allows me to take an input of x, number of rectangles I have, and give me an output of my y's. Okay, I'm going to skip this. This, sim this is a very similar question uh, using those triangles now. Um, but I want to look at a function, okay? So the function is a relationship that pairs each input value with exactly one output value. One input with exactly one output, okay? Um, that's very important for our definition of a function, and we'll talk about in a little bit a visual of this that allows us to to understand that definition a little bit better. Uh, a linear function is a function whose graph is non-vertical line or part of a non-vertical line. So any line, as long as it's not straight up and down, is called a linear function. Uh, when we look at this, it says the, the table shows the relationship between the number of photos that you can take and the amount of memory in megabytes left on your camera's card. It says, is the relationship a linear function? When we look at this, basically what we're trying to say is, uh, to be a linear function, is the amount that these things are changing as these change, are they consistent? So what first I want to do to determine if it's a linear function is I want to say, okay, is that my x values, are they increasing by the same amount? If they are increasing by the same amount, that's the pattern that I want to establish is, remember, this is my independent variable and if they represent or show a pattern it's going to be easy for me to see a pattern here i see a pattern of minus three there minus three there minus three there if i can see that these follow a pattern okay of either you know it could be plus one plus one plus one could be plus two plus two plus two it could be minus one minus one minus one minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, whatever that pattern is. If that pattern is consistent, and these are constant, the, the difference between these are constant, then it will be linear. And what I mean by constant is that it's the same throughout as I look at two back-to-back -back pieces of data. Okay, If it went like negative 3, and then negative 6, and then negative 12, it would not be linear. But because this is negative 3, negative 3, negative 3, this is linear. My ordered pairs are 0, 512, 1, 509, 2, 506, and 3, 503. Okay. Think about this. Identify the dependent variable. Well, the dependent variable is your memory. Remember, mem just logically, memory, how much memory is on my phone or my, my card or whatever, is dependent on how many photos I've taken. Okay, the more photos, the less memory I have left over. Okay, so memory is my dependent. Therefore, number of photos is the independent. So how to determine if the function is linear from the table? If the pattern in X produces a pattern in the Y values, then the function is linear. Um, here what we can do is say, if we want to write an equation, okay, these are my X values. Okay, so if it's linear, it's going to be y equals some something times x plus then something. Okay, well, to find that something that I'm adding to or maybe subtracting eventually um, would be, so, okay, if I have zero x's, if I have, I won't say zero, if I have this, x value to be 0, and I don't know what this number out in front is yet, but if that number times 0, that would give me 0, how do I get 512 from that then? I would have to add 512. So now here's my question. If, if I put a variable of x in here, okay, if I put x in there, and I plug in 0, does it give me 512? So, so far, I've got a 
put 0 in here, plus 512. Does that give me 512? Yes, it does. So that's good so far. But now when I put 1 in for x and then add 512, does that give me 509? And it doesn't. What I need to be able to do is get this thing to subtract 3 from it. So the way we do this, if this is, if this column here, my dependent variable is the same, that number right there is actually the coefficient of the x that you choose. Plug 1 in, you get negative 3 times 1 plus 512 makes that 509. Plug 2 in, gives me negative 6 plus 512 gives me 506. Okay, so if you remember, this number here is the slope, which is rise divided by run. This number here, your independent, or sorry, your dependent variable is your rise. Okay, that negative 3, negative 3, negative 3, that's your rise. This here is plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, that's your run. If you can recognize that, then that gives you what you put in front of your co or your as your coefficient for your x, and then plus whatever you need once you plug in these variables to get that 512 or 509 or 506. Um, these are just different words that we use for independent variable. Okay, obviously our x values call it inputs. One of the most common words we see is domain. Okay, and it's probably a word that maybe we're not all that familiar with. Your dependent variables, you get your y values, your output, but range is a more mathematical word than saying these other two. The notation that we use for input for functions is x is the input, this f, it's, it's usually an italicized or cursive f, and then a parenthesis around x. And that just means that that's the output, okay? By definition, we say f of x. Usually, we, we just call it y. We, we can make that connection, okay? If you want to think about you know what your y values are on your graph, we can think about them as f of x. Um, it says, are the following relations representing linear functions? So, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, well, let's look at this. So, if I go... Input, output. So input are my x's and my output's my y. So you can see these horizontally, but I like to look at them as vertical. So if I go x's and now this is my output of y or f of x maybe. And what I'm going to look at here is x's are 0, 1, 2, and 3. Do those go by plus 1, plus 1, plus 1? And that's what we're looking for. We want that constant increase. If I look at the output for each of these, it's 8, 10, 12, 14. It's plus 2, plus 2, plus 2, plus 2. I guess I don't need that one. But each time it's increasing by 2. So because that's constant and because those were constant, yes, this is a linear function. I can actually tell you that this is the rise and this would be the run. Okay. And now, so if I put an X there, that's my slope. Now, if I chose X to be zero, like this one here, if I put zero right there, what do I need to add to zero to get that eight? And add eight. So now my question is, does F of X equal two X plus eight? Does that produce these other values. If I plug 1 in for x, plug 1 in right there. 2 times 1 plus 8 would give me 10, which is that number there. If I plug 2 in, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 8 is 12, gives me that number there. I'm going to do the same thing for 3. So this is this is the rule here then for that function. Uh, we can graph these points. Uh, 0, 8 right there. 1, 10 right there. 212 and 314 and you can see that those things do end up creating a line.
Um, okay, so now we're getting uh, into the the idea here. If I look at these points, okay, um, and ask you, do those make a linear function? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take them and rewrite them as x's and y's this way. And we'll go 0, 2, 1, 4, 3, 5, and 1, 8. Now, the one thing here that kind of stinks is that, you know, that's plus 1, that's plus 2, and that's minus 2. And here we're seeing plus 2, plus 1, plus 3. Okay, and I can organize these maybe a little bit better to see, maybe I go 0, 1, 1, 3, put them in order. So it would be 2, what, 4, 8, and 5. And the question is, is this is this a, a function? It's a linear function. Well, let's go back up to what we defined a function as. A function said for each x, there is exactly one y. Or for each input, there is exactly one output. Well, here we have an input of 1, and it gives me 4. But I also have then an input of 1, and it gives me 8. So there it says for each x. So in this case, for 1, there is how many outputs? There's an output of 4, and there's an output of 8. There's two outputs there for this x value of 1. That contradicts the definition of a function. This is not a function okay um, one way to determine whether a function by ordered pairs is a function or not is to look at these numbers here and I look to see do any of the x values repeat so then I focus on the ones that do repeat and my question then is okay do the y values that go with them are they different if they're different, automatic no. Okay, if this one was a 4 right here, then 1, 4, and 1, 4, that's the same point. So it would be a yes in that case. Um, relations, just some vocabulary here. Relations are um, any set of ordered pairs, any grouping of um, X's and Y's, okay, so there's a pairing of numbers in one set D with numbers of another set R, um, D for domain, R for range. Um, a function is a relation in which X value is paired with one and, one only, one and only one Y value. Uh, and then set D and set R, talking about how the ranges are. So they're going to ask you these types of questions. They're going to say, okay, if we've got um, this list of ordered pairs, can you tell me what the domain are and what the range are? So dom the way I remember this, domain alphabetically comes first before range does, D and R, how they line up, and X comes alphabetical before Y does. So it helps me remember which one's which, okay? Um, so finding the domain, I'm going to go pluck off the x values, and those become my domain. To find my range, I go pick off the y values, and that's my range. Uh, the question usually is, is, are these, is this a function? Based on these four points, is this a function? Well, it doesn't meet the definition. For every x value, there is one and only one y value. Well, if I look at these x values, do any of these x values repeat? They do not repeat. So then there's no way that I could have duplicate y values for a particular x. So this is a function. Uh, if I come down to this one, it says identify the domain and range here. Domain, remember the x values. So the way we list this, we'll put a bracket, and we should go put the x values, 3, 4, 8, one and then two and then what my range one seven two nine and eleven the question is, is this a function 
Well, let's look at the X values. Do any of them repeat? None of them repeat. So yes, this is a function. Same idea here, just to highlight these. These would be my domain. These are my range. And do any of the blue ones repeat? Nope, so this would be a function. Um, sometimes we'll talk about what's called a mapping. So a mapping is going to look like this. It's just going to be two bubbles. And they'll have, I'm just going to put D here and R. D for domain, R for range. And they'll have your X values inside here. So a 4, 3, 1, negative 2, and then negative 4. Uh, and then... Sorry about all this. Okay, so then in in this bubble, they will have one, four, two, seven, negative two, and a mapping just shows you four pairs with one. So it'll be because this is your, this is going to be your independent, and this will be your dependent. You always start with like a, an endpoint here, and then an arrow to the dependent. Uh, three to four, one to two, negative two to seven, negative four to negative two. Pretty easy to see a mapping. Now, what we want to do to determine whether it's a function or not is basically if, as long as every x value over here or domain value over here only has one arrow coming out of it, then it is going to be a function. Okay. But if I had like four also going down here to negative two and it went to one, then it would not be a function. And the reason for that is I would I would ask the question to everybody in class. Everybody look at the y value or the range value that goes with 4. Well, some of you would be looking at 1, and some of you would be looking, in this case, negative 2. That's a problem. We want everybody to be on the same page. Everybody have the same value that they're looking at. So this would not be a function. But if I did this, and I say now everybody look at the y value that goes with 4, everybody's looking at 1. Okay, so if you can ask that question and you have everybody looking at the same value for that particular x and then for all x's, then you have a function. If you have people looking at different values for a particular x, for all values of x, then you would not have a function. Um, here it says identify the domain range for these. So again, domain 6464. Four. Okay. Now, generally speaking, we don't like to repeat when we write our domain, so we're just going to write 6 and 4. And then the range is 5, 3, 4, and 8. So if we're going to make a mapping here, my domain, and then over here, my range, my domain is only going to be the number 6 and 4. So 6. Four. My range is going to be five, three, four, and eight. Now, if I think about this, six, that ordered pair, so six should go to five. This ordered pair says six should also go to four. And right there, because six is now being paired with two different y values, one input is being paired with two different outputs, this is not a function. It is also not a function because four should be paired with three, and also four goes to eight. 
But like I said, if you've got multiple arrows coming out of the input bubble from one point, one data value, one coordinate, to multiple coordinates over here, you violate the definition of a function. An alternative way of determining a function is to use what we call the vertical line test. Okay, uh, and this is, I think this is the most obvious way of realizing this. Uh, vertical line test says if any vertical line passes through more than one point of the graph for some domain value of x, there is more than one range value, um, thus it violates the definition of a function. So, if I look at this set of word pairs here, from what we've been talking about, a couple different ways of doing this, negative 4, negative 3, 0, negative 4, and 1 are my domain. And I asked myself, do any of those domains repeat? Well, negative 4 and negative 4 repeat. And the question is, okay, if they repeat, do their y values differ? And they do. So by looking at a list of ordered pairs, because these y value or these x values repeat, but the y values are different, that tells me that negative 4 is going to either be, if I ask the class, there we look at the y value that goes with negative 4, some are looking at 2, some are looking at negative 1, that's a problem, this would not be a function. If we were to do a mapping of this, where I got my domain, and I got my range, so negative 4, negative 3, 0, negative 4, and 1. Now, I wrote negative 4 twice here. You'll never write the repeats over here. So I repeat the negative 4. And now we're talking about my range. So my range was 2, 1, negative 2, negative 1, and another 2. So I've already got 2. So negative 4 would go there for that word pair. Negative 3 goes to 1. 0 goes to negative 2. And now we've got negative 4 going down to negative 1. And we'll come back with 1 going back to 2. Okay? And this right here is the problem. We have 2 arrows coming off of an x value to two different y values. Okay. Now, graphically, I think it makes it it's a little bit easier to see using the vertical line test. So negative 4, 2 would be that point there. Negative 3, 1 would be that point. 0, negative 2. Negative 4, negative 1. And then 1, 2. Okay, so what the vertical line test says is you're going to construct a vertical line. So I'll just make this blue line here my vertical line. And what you're going to do is you're going to drag that thing through your entire graph. Okay, and if it ever intersects your graph two spots for a 1x value, two different y spots, y values, you violate the vertical line test. Okay, so I'm going to go right here. Do you see where... There we cross twice, we cross right there, and we cross right there. That is the graphic, the XY graphic, of what we're seeing here in this mapping. It's these two blue things that I've highlighted is being represented right here a different way. But if I keep going through, so we're okay right there, it only intersects once there, only intersects once there, and only intersects once there. But failing right there is enough to say that the whole thing is not a function. All right, so I've got, let's see here, just a couple different, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through the rest of these notes right now with you. Um, let's say we had something that looked like these. Let's say I plot my ordered pairs that look like this, and now I take my vertical line. Let's say okay. 
All right, so let's say that I've got this line here. We'll make it red. That's my vertical line, okay? And I can slide it, move it back through, okay? So it's showing show going all through my graph. So my graph is only these points here that I've plotted. How many times? So when it starts to intersect my graph, does it ever intersect twice? So there it only intersects one time. So, so far I'm passing the vertical line test. There it only intersects one time, so we're good. There only one time, still good. So we're keep passing it. There only one time, and there only one time. So we passed it all the way through, we're good. Um, let's say I put a point right there. So pass, 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 but right there, we fail. And the reason, if I say everybody look at the Y value that goes with X being 10, X is 10, some people are going to look at a Y value of 2, some people are going to look at a Y value of 4, and that's a problem. Okay, you can kind of see over here the same thing happening with their ordered pairs. So that would be a failure of the vertical line test, and this would not be a function. Now, a lot of times what we like to do is we like to look at um, particular um, particular like graphs. So if I graph like any line, let's just go like a y equals one half x minus two or three. So if I look at that, and I take my vertical line and I pass it through it, does my vertical line only ever intersect that black line once no matter where it's at? And because of that, no matter where that I'm only intersecting one time and that intersection point is that point A. That's the only intersection I ever get on any of those red vertical lines. So that means that this line here is a function. And what happens is that every line, unless it's ver vertical, is a function. But other lines that we come across, or other curves that we come across, are things like y equals, let's just go like x squared. So we get that. And then the question is, well, how many times do I intersect that? Well, in any point, and then you can see that right there, we're only intersecting one time right there. Right there, only one time. So that's a, that passes the vertical line test. This black thing, this parabola, is a function. Um, if we have something like this, let's go y equals, uh, let's go something that we're not really maybe all that familiar with, but we will get familiar with. the circle. Okay. Now if I mess around with this, right there you can see that my vertical line you know, there you go. My vertical line only touches one time right there. Touches only one time right there as well. So at that stage I pass. Passed the vertical line test so far. But there I fail it. And what we learned hopefully last year is that in order for something to be true, it needs to be true all the time. So here, that's not true. I do not pass through that black curve only one time for that x value of negative 0.7. So I fail the vertical line test. One failure makes an infinite number of, of truths or successes false. Um, Hopefully that makes sense, uh, that introduction to um, functions and the different ways that we're going to see them and interpret them. Um, but again, the main, the main focus, the main reason we're talking about functions is right now we want to be able to talk about the idea that if, if Mr. Faye says, everybody tell me what the x value of 5, what, what is the y value that goes with an x value of 5, then we're all focusing on the same y value. And if that's the case, if, we, if we'll do that, then what we're dealing with is a function. But I need to be able to do that for all x's that exist, okay? Um, 
hopefully that's a good introduction, um, and we'll we'll move on from there uh, in the next video.